So hello, it's Paul in Perth here today. The date is the 5th of September 19... No, I was going to say 5th of September 1970, because that might be my birthday. Um, but it's actually the 5th of September 2023. I forget which cancer update it is, but it's whatever is down below right now. And I'm sitting with someone that you might think has a uh, bit of a familial resemblance to me. Maybe the same nose, maybe? Certainly the same <laughs> haircut of champions. This is my oldest brother, um, David. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop up on the screen a graphic just to show you the family tree because several of you have asked um, to understand my family tree and I'll just pop it up on the screen there. So as you can see, uh, both David and I, uh, or in fact all five of my siblings, we share the same uh, two parents, which was Len and Joan. David, this, this handsome chap here, um, is the firstborn and he uh, has married a lovely woman called Cara and they have begat two, ch two, two children. Uh, the second born is our sister Carolyn and Carolyn married a lovely gentleman called Tim and they've had three children. The third born was Graham. Graham has never married and has no children. Uh, Noel, who you have met in previous episodes, um, has married a lovely lady named Connie they have uh, no kids, and you know me, of course, and you know that I've never married and I've never had any kids. So that's the way our family um, lays out. But I thought it was about time you met David. David uh, normally leaves, lives on the east coast of um, Australia, but he's come over for the west just to um, spend some time with me, given the current situation, and um, also because this is my birthday month, as you know. So here is David and... Um, Hi, everyone. <laughs> yeah, and um, oh, and actually one thing I wanted to point out was a lot of you have pointed out that um, that I come across as a teacher and I, I often reply back to that saying, once a teacher, always a teacher. So through our family tree, David, you have been a what teacher? Um, a maths teacher for most of my career, but... Uh, in the last couple of years before I was um, basically COVID retired, um, <laughs> I did some uh, teaching of um, English as a second language. Yeah, yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah, what? which is similar to what... Absolutely. So what was their first language? Uh, for most of them, it was Mandarin. Get yeah. out! Where were, yeah. where were you teaching that? Um, I was teaching at a, a place called St Paul's International College, which is in Mossvale, New South Wales. So we had a lot of boarders um, and particularly towards the, the end of my, my 20 years there, um, um, most of them were, were mainland Chinese, you know, Mandarin speakers. Yeah. Uh, when I first started there, um, there was a, a lot of Hong Kongers and, um, you know, some Vietnamese, uh, even uh, one or two African right? uh, students. Yeah, I didn't know that. Now I've just noticed there's a light burning, burning us out here. So, Dave, if you can just hold the hold the fort here, I'm just going to rush okay. off and, and uh, right. turn that light off. Yeah. So um, that's a, a little bit of uh, of my work history. I, I actually started teaching uh, in in WA, um, and um, then. I uh, got the opportunity to uh, to go overseas and uh, <coughs> taught in Zimbabwe for uh, a couple of years, uh, just, just before we, we had children. So we actually came back when uh, we were expecting our firstborn family. And if there's one thing about um, siblings is we love to travel. Oh, so yeah. David, perhaps you could talk about some of the countries you've not only travelled to, but you've actually worked in. Yeah, well, the, um, apart from Zimbabwe, we also uh, worked in Fiji. Um, uh, my wife, Cara, was uh, um, a university counsellor at um, uh, USP, the University of the South Pacific, and um, I worked at the International School, Suva. And um, at that time, we had... Uh, um, you know, school aged children, so so they went to the international yeah. school as well. So that's so that's the teaching um, history of the firstborn, David. Then our second um, elder sibling is our sister Carolyn. And Carolyn, of course, was a geography teacher. Yeah. And a little bit of maths on A little bit of maths, yeah. Yeah. 
Third born is Graham. Graham is the only one of all of our siblings that um, didn't end up doing any teaching in his career. Fourth born is Noel that you've met. Now, Noel is, I wouldn't call him the classic classroom teacher, but what he does do is a thing called Men's Shed. And is Men's Shed, is that Australia only or Western Australia only? Uh, it, it's certainly Australia wide. Oh, so you do have it over east? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So just to explain to people that aren't from Australia, Men's Shed is, um, I don't know whether it came out of like the health department as a mental health thing for yeah. sort of act belong commit. Yeah, I um, don't know. Look, perhaps I'll explain it. it to you, mm. and you can you can perhaps in the feedback in the in the comments section you can tell us whether you have it in your country. Mm. What men's shed is is um, oh, do you remember the the coffee table that actually the camera is sitting on right now that Noel made? Noel mm. made that in men's shed. So what mm. men's shed is is where typically retired men, although you don't have to be a retired man goes to to hang out with other males and pass on knowledge basically with things like woodworking and a little bit of, of, of metal work and and really just to to bond men with men um, in a in a in a healthy environment doing useful things like mm. woodworking mm. and um, and we call that men's shed and um, that's something that goes on in WA and what the fourth born Noel does is Noel is a shift supervisor. So he will, for example, demonstrate how to use a, um, a wood planer or a, a circular saw or something because these men's sheds have lots of pieces of equipment in them, but you have to be certified to use them. And Noel is an instructor and a um, assessor. He signs people off on their mm. Um, their proficiency at, at being able to use a piece of equipment. Um, so that's Noel. So Noel is a teacher. And as you know, I used to teach English as a second language, for one. Number two, you know, this YouTube channel started as me teaching how to fix Mazda 3s and Toyota Corollas. Um, what you may not know is I used to be a Microsoft certified trainer. So in the early um, 2000s, I was teaching um, Active Directory, Microsoft Active Directory, Microsoft Exchange, Microsoft SQL, Microsoft SMS 2.0, which later became SCCM, and basically the whole range of back office Microsoft products. So of the five siblings, four of them have actually ended up in, um, in teaching in some capacity. Mm. So it does appear to be within our genes to, it does. Yeah. to, to do yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think really, um, our father, even though he was never a, um, a you know, a, a formal a qualified teacher, teacher yeah. uh, just had an ability to to teach. To he pass really on was, wasn't he? And, and, and yeah. as as you guys know, and as David definitely knows, mm. it was what I, how I really bonded with him was yeah. working on cars, and yeah. he would he was just so happy to pass on that knowledge of here's how you change the drum brakes brakes on a Tirana. Yeah. You know, yeah. and and um, here's how you use it because I, mean, I remember we had that. Do you remember we had the circular saw that had basically, oh, yeah. but it had no. Do you remember it had no safety guard on it? It was just the, yeah, yeah. Yeah. freaked me out, man. But that's how it was. But but we would we would cut um, the firewood on it and, yeah. and what have you. And yeah. Dad was always Dad. One classic thing you, you can tell me whether you remember this. Dad used to find like a broken down washing machine, repair it and then send it off to the church fate, and then the oh. fate... Do you remember him doing this? No, I don't. But that is it might have been after you left home. Yeah. He, um, he would, you know, the, on the curb collection or whatever, he would, there would be broken down washing machines, yeah. dryers. I mean, I even, I even helped him, I remember him helping him repair a kettle, because I remember that we had to change the element in the kettle. Right. okay. So yeah. dad, dad would just fix anything. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is where I've ended up being so proficient at fixing cars, is yeah. for all of my formative years, it was, come on, Paul, we'll fix the Tirana. Oh, yeah, we'll mm. fix the, the, the mm. what else do we have? There was a Tirana, there was a, Coro there was a Corona, there was a Corolla. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think it probably became easier for him to... To do that once the older siblings. Oh, once you'd left home. Left home yeah, because you know, of course, remember, David's the firstborn. I'm the fifth. 
So, and there's obviously three in between us. So mm. yeah, you're probably right. Yeah. Like the, maybe, maybe dad had the pressure coming off and he's like, oh, okay, I'm down yeah. to the last two. Cause Graham and I were the last two to leave home. Mm. Um, and maybe that was it. Maybe I did get the relaxed dad. Yeah. Whereas maybe you got the new, new father dad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was still pretty relaxed. Um, it was pretty chill, wasn't it? He was, yeah. 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 But um, I, I think he, um, maybe he just, just tuned in to, to our natural interests. And, um, you know, I remember him, uh, you know, uh, talking mathematics to me. And, uh, so, so tell me about that, because I, I, I've got my own memories of mathematics as a kid. So you ended up obviously getting a maths degree. Mm. Did, so when you were a kid, was, was dad teaching you maths over the dinner table? Um, no, I don't, I don't recall him, him doing that, but um, uh, I, I vaguely remember some instant where um, we were calling out to, to Dad. Um, um, I think Graham might have uh, called out, Dad, what's, what's the chemical symbol for lead? And he'd say, it's PB. And, um, uh, and I'd, I'd say, Dad, what's the quadratic formula again? And then, <laughs> You know, you just rattle it off and uh, then... Um, a squared plus B... Anyway, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the square root of A squared plus B squared over something or other. I'll write it down here. That's what I'm trying to remember. I know it exists. See, that's the thing. I know it exists and that's it I'm putting down there, all right? Do you want and there's to... an A... Do you know it? Yeah, yeah. Go X on, equals then. minus B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC all over 2A. 2A, right. I've got the 2A bit, all right? I do yeah. know this stuff. Yeah, but, but uh, you know, we, we were uh, shouting out these questions and um, then my sister asked something like, um, Dad, ha, uh, what's the difference between pearl stitches and, uh, and plain? And he says, ah, oh, that's a question for your mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, and... Which makes makes me prompts the question for you that was there a good dynamic then between mum and dad? Yeah, I, I felt there was. Yeah, yeah. and and I, yeah. I did too. And it's interesting hearing you say that because mm. those are what I describe as sort of classic nineteen sixties roles. Of oh yeah, dad fixed the car, mum did the sewing. Yeah, and so that was how it was, right? I, it was. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And whilst I understand the world has moved on from that model, yeah, it certainly did work for them, right? Yeah. And, and I mean, Dad was very supportive of Mum's career as well because um, you know she was a, a certified nurse. I, I think well, she, she used to say I was a sister. I mean, yes, yeah. she used to. We say, oh, like she's a nurse, and Mum would go, I'm a three certificate sister. I remember. Yeah. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, and you know, uh, Dad would uh, would cook for us when Mum um, you know went off for a shift of, of work and. I don't yeah. remember that so much, but okay. Yeah. 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 So yeah. my memory is, is more of, of more of really classic roles. Like, yeah. like dad was the breadwinner, mum kept the home in order. Yeah. But so it's actually interesting to hear, hear you say dad would cook sometime, because I don't remember that. Right, right. Okay, so yeah. that, that did happen. Mm, it did. Yeah. 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 I mean, it'd be probably fairly basic meals, you know, just yeah, uh, yeah. mashed potatoes, um, peas and sausages. And, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so just to explain, because we haven't really given the background on mum and dad. So mum was um, the daughter of a dairy farmer in um, Apollo Bay, in the Apollo Bay Colac area of, of Victoria. So mum was really practical. Or what, was, what, was, what would your take be, that she was a practical mm. woman? Oh, very practical. Yeah, yeah. and um, so mum... Um, she was, a, I would describe as not a fancy um, in the in the kitchen. It was mm. it was peas and carrots and boiled baked potatoes and yeah. and uh, and that. But it, it was nutritious food. But it was nu nutritious food that you could tell had come from the daughter of a farmer. Oh yeah, I would yeah. say. And I don't think that's unfair. And she made great desserts, you know. Yeah, crumble yeah, yeah. And, and actually, I remember her meatloaf was. I remember that as being absolutely delicious. Mm. And apricot chicken, she was really Oh, yes. Yes, yes. there you go. Yeah, favourite. Um, yeah. So that was mum. So mum was a dairy farmer's um, daughter. Dad, what are the... Well, dad... So our grandparents on our father's side were um, thespians. 
they were, mm. they were actors. Yeah. Which, if you're wondering where I get my exuded um, nature from, and that is, oh, you already know that I've that I've been a go-go dancer and I've been a catwalk model and what have you. My father's parents were both actors. They did Gilbert and Sullivan um, uh, plays. Are they? Yeah. Do they? Yeah. Um, um, and that was their thing. They, they were performers. Now, for whatever reason, it skipped Dad. B mm. But sort of. Like, I wouldn't say Dad was introverted. Dad no. used to go to Rostrum. Yeah. So Rostrum, for those of you that don't know, is a bit like, I think in the US you call it Lions Club? Is that? Um, yeah, there's also Toastmasters. I think. Oh, okay. So um, yeah. it's, it's a public speaking forum. Um, so Dad was not introverted in that he would um he was very interested in public speaking and being a good orator mm. um and he was certainly when you're around him i would say you felt welcome oh yeah um but maybe i'd say possibly not as extroverted as i am or oh yeah no you you you're far more the extrovert yeah and yet dad did have qualities of that because oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like I'm I'm just the I'm the amplified version of mm. Dad, and I feel like I'm so Dad's father's name was Charles. Charles. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna have to blank that out. Um, Charles, and doing all the Gilbert and Sullivan stuff, and I I feel like I'm more like Charles mm -hmm. because he was okay to be on stage. Right. Yeah, and yeah. and Violet, I I don't I, I I'm I guess the two of them were into that. Mm. Um, but um, yeah, I, f I feel like I'm that because I loved being on stage. Right. I enjoyed right. being on the catwalk. Yeah. Um, yeah. On the catwalk runway. I love it. It's. I love it when people are looking at me, mm. which is perhaps why I'm here right now. Mm. Um, didn't didn't bother me at all. Whereas Dad, I think would he would say he would want to publicly speak, but he wouldn't say I want to be in a fashion show or I yeah. want to be in a in a Gilbert yeah. and Sullivan play. Yeah. Yeah, so he, he had it, but I think I'm the amplified version. Mm. Now, I'm curious, where do you... Would you go on stage? Would you act? Um, possibly, yeah. I mean, I, I used to um, um, do some singing, you know, particularly with... Now, I won't ask you to do it today. No, no. But just to <laughs> let you know, just to let you know, yesterday, Dave sang a song that I've never heard before and it's a song to do with my birth. I'm not going to embarrass Dave by asking him now, but Dave did sing yesterday. And as a 50-something-year-old, because I can't tell you whether I'm before or after my 53rd birthday today, um, it was the first time I'd ever heard it. So I'm 52 or 53 years old, and yesterday when he sang it was the first time I'd heard it. But it's a song about my birth, and David sang it in a singing voice. Um, and we'll see whether not today. I won't do. It, I won't do it now. But maybe, maybe soon. Maybe yeah, I can. Yeah. Maybe you can sing it on on film. But don't mm. feel pressured. Okay. Now to talk about David as a personality, or David as um, what his interests are. I said to David earlier today that David was an ornithologist, and David very rapidly corrected me. And perhaps you could explain the correction that I, that I gave. Yeah, I, I just feel that um, to call me an ornithologist would be to um, exaggerate my, my, <laughs> my station. Um, I feel like uh, an ornithologist would have some uh, some training um, in um, you know in bird, observing birds, uh, observing yeah. birds, and um, and you know. Uh, noting behaviours and uh, and doing measurements and data collection and so on. Whereas I, a birder, yeah, as a, a birder, I'm I'm interested in in seeing as many birds as I can and and observing behaviour. But I I I don't really have that um, kind of scientific. Yeah, um, and whilst I have Craig here, the Mexican um, neck pillow dog, I believe oh, you have Jorge there. Jorge. <laughs> so Jorge is a blue-footed blue booby, booby. Uh, that, that Caroline actually um, brought from the Galapagos Islands back to me yeah. when um, when I was first diagnosed. And um, you've been to the Galapagos? Yes, yes. In fact, um, the, the blue-footed booby was... Um, 
uh, one of our bucket list birds. Um, you know, my, um, my wife particularly likes kind of uh, listing out the birds uh, in the world that she should really, really like to see. And the blue-footed booby uh, was one of those. And, um, and she, we, hit a, she hit a milestone just the other day, didn't she? Oh, yes. Um, she uh, hit the milestone of 600 uh, Australian species. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's great. And um, a lot I'm of... only about 100 behind her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you were at 500, eh? Yeah, around that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, a lot, of, a lot of my viewers are from overseas. So, how would you describe the bird watching uh, richness of Australia compared to other countries? Ah, now that's a good question. Um, look, Australia has some wonderful species. Uh, I think, particularly our parrots and um, and fairy wrens and finches. Um, uh, particularly beautiful and, and colourful. Uh, also, we've got um, honey eaters, and um, you know that that's a you know a whole group of birds that uh, uh, other countries I don't think any have any of. So but okay. I, I really should fact check. No, that's okay. No, so I'll give you a generalised question. Mm. Then. So if you were to recommend one area that a birder from overseas coming to Australia for the first time would have a great time, what, what area of Australia would, would you suggest that they visit? Okay. Um, anywhere around um, northern Queensland, I think. Is so north of Cairns? Up to uh, around, uh, look, from uh, Townsville north. North. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, it's um, do you know very that, rich in Do you know that really life. reminds me of? So you know I've done a lot of work in Papua New Guinea, which, yeah. is, which is just beyond there. Mm. And man, I've never come across as rich bird life. And I'm not a birder, right? Yeah. But um, for me, I'm more an entomologist. So I, I, when I went there, you'd remember the bug, oh, bug, bug wars. wars. Yeah. So I was into the bugs. My first mm. ever, um, uh, what was it, was a blog series? Yeah, it was a blog. Yeah. was a series called um, Bug Wars where, it, and it was, um, that was when I worked for Chevron Texaco up in PNG. So that was the year 2000. And um, and this was in an email format. And I was fascinated by the insects uh, because Papua New Guinea has incredible variety of insects. And the insects are damn large, right? So they're, they're impossible to ignore. But when it's not the insects, it's the birds that eat the insects. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the bird life of, mm. I, I think, I, I guess for me, I was just more into the insects because they were more in the camp I could find. Oh, yeah. yeah. Where, and, but I think um, the bird life for you in Papua New Guinea would be amazing. Oh, and, yeah. And, it, and when that northern, you're talking about northern Queensland there, which is that, that run of land that heads up to yeah. Papua. Yeah. And, and, which, and we get uh, a number of species coming down from that, that, that can just fly over yeah. the Torres Strait. Yeah, yeah. So it, 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 they are the Papuan species making yeah. it to Australia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so there you go. So if you're a, a birder, or even if you're the fully blown ornithologist, uh, David's recommendation is Northern Queensland. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and, uh, but I mean anywhere in Australia. Yeah, yeah. like okay. you would notice when I filmed in the backyard that you can hear bird noise, and I'm. T less than 10 kilometres from the very centre of Perth uh, mm -hmm. and, and I have native species that are in my backyard. Um, mm -hmm. Australia is, I, I don't think it's too much to say, we are blessed with, oh, yeah. with, yeah. uh, with bird life in Australia. Yeah. So if you're a birder, if you're an ornithologist or anything like that, or even, and I'm really, I'm not a birder or an ornithologist, but I love it. So um, yeah, come on down, there's plenty of space, uh, we'll fit you in. <laughs> uh, so um, yeah. Uh, oh, right, I better give you a cancer update because I'm probably oh, going to yes. put the title of cancer update mm. on this. Now, I haven't posted to you for, I think the last update was September 1, so that's four days since I've posted. Um, what happened was on September, um, late September 1, September 2, and for the first part of yesterday, I was very lethargic. Um, I wasn't up to doing a lot. And I certainly wasn't up to making a video. Um, today, or yesterday and today, I've taken a half 
um, steroid tablet. So you're aware that I'm on the dexmethasone, which is a, a corticosteroid that uh, my um, oncologist has prescribed to me. I took a half tablet yesterday, I took a half tablet today, and that has lifted my um, energy level to the point where I feel relatively normal. I don't feel full of energy and whatever, but I feel normal enough that I can. I was able to plan yeah. a video with David and um, and we've had a fairly normal day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so my, my energy level is neither dramatically low nor dramatically high. Yeah. It's just been normal. Yeah. Um, so for those of you that are on the cancer journey, um, my personal experience with dexmethasone has been, um, a, 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 in fact, whole, wholly a good one. The Certainly when I take a half tablet, I feel just fine. Just instead of lethargic, I just feel normal. Mm -hmm. Occasionally when I've taken the whole tablet, I've gone from lethargic to what I'd describe as maybe a little bit speedy, um, as in... My, my enough that Caroline has recognized a difference in my personality, mm -hmm. put it that way. So she would say, you're talking fast, you're talking loud, you're you know rabbiting on. And then I would actually have difficulty getting to sleep that night. So instead of being lethargic, I was actually, um, what's the word when you come? Manic. <laughs> Slightly manic, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, mm -hmm. that, would, that would be correct. Yeah. So what I found is the half tablet um, is, has been the solution mm -hmm. there. Um, so yeah, so just so you know, um, on the cancer journey, um, yeah, I've had a little bit of lethe lethargy. Um, nausea has been under control. I've been eating quite normally. Um, and the neuropathy now, because I'm in week two of my um, round four of chemo, and in round two, so after seven days, the half-life of the drugs that you've been given has pretty much worn out. So from days eight to 14, you're pretty much in recovery cycle without any of the chemo drugs virtually existing in your body. Um, and I have no, no noticeable neuropathy at the moment, so cold things aren't bothering me. So, um, so that's my cancer update. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So um, yeah, Dave is staying with us for a few days. Um, yep. And it's great being here, isn't it? Yeah. I'm loving. I'm honestly yeah. loving having you here, buddy. Mm. It's it's really good. Mm. We're really bonding. Um, well, we always have, haven't we? Yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah. We, I I regard Paul as um, my apprenticeship in fatherhood. Oh, is that right? I do. I was um, about to turn eighteen I think, when, when I was you born. Were born. Yeah. And um, you know, I I just kind of learnt the drill of you know how really? to deal with babies and and um, but but the, I think you have told me that before but I'm I'm, I'm processing it differently now mm. so, um so as an 18 year old were you thinking I definitely want to have kids and this will be what it's like because mm. because your first well, statement kind of implies yeah that. yeah I, look I think I think I just saw it as being a natural thing for me to to go into because uh, I mean I I uh, so you I just felt, lo I, I loved having a little brother and, and but you uh, felt fatherly towards me oh yeah yeah that's really yeah. cool do you know do you know one thing I remember about you and this is I know that I've I've posted a couple of um, mathematics videos there's if you look at my back catalogue there's one on binary mathematics and another one on hexadecimal mathematics I want to tell you this is the guy that did that but this guy has our father to thank for. Do you remember that over the dinner table, you used to give me arithmetic progressions? Oh, yeah. You used to say to me, three, five, seven, nine, what's the next number? Ah, Do you remember yes. doing that? I think so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so as I went through primary school and high school, because you were a teacher by, a maths teacher by that stage. I, I would have been at that yeah. stage, yeah. And I, I promise you, what you were doing was you were giving me the mathematics lessons of the year above me. Ah, right, right. Yes, yes, so yes. as I went through, mm. as I went through primary school, but definitely through high school, I blitzed mathematics, and it's yeah. because you were training me over the di mm. dinner table. Mm. But I specifically remember the arithmetic and geometric right. progressions yes. yeah. that you would give me over the over the dinner table. So oh, this guy is why I did so well at maths um, in particularly high school and then at university. Um, a little bit in my first degree, I did uh, uh, some subjects called decision support, which is where 
you calculate the return on investment of making certain decisions based on certain types mm. of risks, which um, has helped me later in life with things like um, putting money on the stock market. Right. When I did my second degree, um, which was in medical imaging, I had to do fully blown calculus, like right. full blown calculus. Mm. Like they, one of the quest, one of the questions on the final exam I remember was, you need to design a can that holds three hundred and seventy five mils of liquid. What is the least amount of material you can do it in to hold that much fluid? And of course, you have to do you have to do the area of the two spheres that are the top and the bottom mm. of the can, yeah. and the the um, cylinder in the middle, yeah. and you then have to integrate it. Yeah. And that was on the final exam. So it was that level of calculus. Mm. And I got 100% yeah, yeah. on the calculus exam. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, at yeah. university level. And it's because mm. of you. Mm. So well done. Thank you. I worked yeah. out all right. Yeah. So, but oh, congrats, you buddy. <laughs> it, it is you. And both of us have our dad to thank. Oh, yeah. So you were telling us um, earlier, and of course, I have no recollection because I wasn't alive when this happened, of dad teaching you maths. Oh, yeah. Uh, it was just kind of incidental. He, did, he never kind of sat me down for a lesson or anything, but um, I don't know, it just um, helped. You know, like, like that thing I just call out to Dad, you know, what's up? Oh, what's the quadratic formula yeah, or whatever? And, yeah, and he'd, he'd know it and just, yeah. just give it straight back. And, and just, just to give you an idea of what our Dad was like, what our Dad did for fun was he was in the Morse Code Club do you remember this? Mm. And he used to send and receive Morse code in the back room, yep. out by the back door. Yeah. And that was his idea of fun. You know, mm. he would he would send and receive Morse code to people overseas. He also had shortwave radio. Yeah. So yeah. he was a ham. He was a ham radio yeah. enthusiast. <laughs> and um, he was really big on Esperanto. And I mm. I forget whether I've talked to you guys about this before, but part of my love of or my embracing of foreign languages, and mm. perhaps yours. Did did Dad have an Esperanto flavour with you? Oh or, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, that, I, that I, was I, even then. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I um, I actually started to learn it for. for I did a while. too. Yeah. So here's the thing. So imagine this. I'm a kid, right? I'm a ten year old kid. I've got this guy doing arithmetic and geometric progressions mm. with me. We've got our dad speaking to us in Esperanto. And Esperanto, in case you don't know, is based on Latin, Greek, and Slavic, and Germanic, mm. which is the basis of all European languages, including mm. English. So that was what I grew up with um, during my formative years. So later on, when it came to learning French at high school, and then Spanish later on, and, and, um, and, and I actually ended up doing straight up Latin and straight up Greek. Our next door neighbour spoke Greek. And Dad would just send me next door to... And I did end up speaking mm. Greek. Mm. Um, so when it came for me to learn... I didn't know. That's didn't you know that? No. Yeah, no. I used to go next door and speak Greek. Uh, yeah. um, and um, and that's that's why my, my etymology now is... Oh, I, yeah. I, I'll sometimes see a new word and um, and I, I can... I won't know the word, but I'll, I'll try and derive it yeah. from... Yeah. And it was even... We were talking recently about euthanasia. And you, E-U, means... Good. There you go, right? Yeah. You know. So I didn't plant that, by the way. That <laughs> genuinely was him right then. So EU mean is Greek for good. If you think of eulogy, euphoria, Eucharist, um, in uh, uh, the eucalyptus tree, and eucalyptus is a tricky one. Eucalyptus means um, good covering. And calyptus mm. is because the eucalyptus gum nut is a very good covering. And that's mm. what eucalyptus means. Euthanasia, so you also know the you part of euthanasia is good. What does Thanos mean in Greek? Death. Yes, mm. correct. So euthanasia literally is euthanos, so which means good death. And um, and that, that's the, the origin of, of that, that word. Mm. Um, which and, and as I've spoken to you before, there's a very high possibility that, um, or probability, I should say, that I am going to, going to take part in euthanasia because the laws of this state allow me to do this. Um, and it differs greatly. And I'm quite sad for people from the United States because the way the United States legislation is written, it doesn't talk about euthanasia. It often talks about assisted suicide. And I feel quite 
um, sad and upset mm. for those of you in the United States that you have that word. Mm. Do you know the origins of suicide? No. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll help you through this. Think about mm. the side part. Mm. Can you think of other words that have side in it? Genocide. Genocide, matricide. Matricide. Yeah. Regicide. So killing. So it means killing, you're right. Yeah. Self-killing. So self self -killing. You're right. Yeah. So whereas mm. euthanasia literally translates as good death, suicide translates as self-killing. And I feel very sorry for, um, sorry, I feel sad, I guess, mm. for those of you in the United States where the legislation refers to assisted suicide because what that's implying is um, assisted self-killing. And I, I don't like the how that sounds and I don't like how that feels and I don't mm. like the um, I don't I, I just don't like the backstory behind yeah. that yeah. I, I, th I think it's um, unkind an unkind word to put into yeah. legislation yeah I very much prefer the word euthanasia meaning good death uh, mm. because what I want to have is a good death I don't want to have self-killing mm. um, so I feel very lucky um, to live um, in Australia and in Western Australia where uh, euthanasia is is the term we use and that's what the legislation talks about. And also, assuming I do go ahead with euthanasia, what my death certificate will say is my underlying disease. So my death certificate is, is going to say death from pseudomyxoma peritonei. Mm -hmm. It's going to make no mention of yeah. how that finally occurred. Yeah. Um, and and I, I find that um, I, I just find that right. Basically, mm. if I can be honest with you, I just find that right. Yeah. Um, and if I if I could express one thing to those of you in the United States, at the moment you have ten districts and states collectively that allow what in America is called dying with dignity. Um, I'm glad that you have that available, and I'm glad that. Uh, Oregon and Vermont allow you to do it with from other states because that means even if you're in Texas which doesn't allow it you can travel to either Oregon or Vermont mm. and achieve the outcome you want uh, what makes me a little bit sad is it's referred to as assisted suicide um, I, 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 I just don't like the wording of it um, but I'm, I'm glad you are able to achieve the outcome you want um, which is at least better than the United Kingdom, where you have no... Are you aware of this in the United no. Kingdom? No, in the United Kingdom, they don't have um, either euthanasia or assisted suicide. Mm. It is just straight out illegal. Um, mm. And you would remember, and David is well aware, that our mother was a palliative care nurse for mm. part of her life. Mm. And mum was certainly clear with me, I assume she was clear with you, that... Mum had assisted people to pass away. Were you aware mm. of that or not? So, okay, yeah. I promise you, when mm. Mum worked at Mount Henry mm. Hospital, yeah. um, she was in the palliative care unit at yeah. Mount Henry Hospital, which is maybe after you left home. Maybe that's why I remember it and you don't. Mm. She was very clear to me that during, when people were clearly palliative yeah. and, and clearly, let's be honest, better off passing on, yeah. she, would knowing knowingly but but unsaid yeah. would up the morphine until yeah. they were gone yeah. and she had no regrets about it yeah. that all the nurses and all the doctors knew that that was the deal yeah. and that they felt that it was the kind and right oh, thing yeah. and it was not openly spoken about but everyone knew yeah. and it's a palliative care unit we're not talking yeah. about a general hospital no you're there for palliative care yeah and um, yeah, mum was quite clear with me that, that this this is what I have done and I'm okay with it. Yeah. And I think yeah. for me now that I've ended up in my situation, the fact that mum was so clear on that, you would also mm. be aware that mum and dad had a euthanasia pact. Mm. You're aware of that, right? Um, I wasn't aware of that as such, but I knew that dad was involved in... Um, is it voluntary? Uh, uh, was it wave or something? Was yeah, that, that was wave, voluntary. Yeah, vol system. wave. Yeah, voluntary euthanasia society. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Well, this is news to you then. So around the dinner table, uh, then this must have been after you left home. Yeah. Yeah. Mum and dad would make it very clear to the kids at the table, and I guess you'd left home, mm. that mum and dad had a uh, had a mutual um, euthanasia pact. Mm. 
and they had rules around when it was okay and when it wasn't. So, right. for example, paraplegia mm. was no. Mm. Quadriple uh, tetraplegia was a definite yes. Mm -hmm. Quadriplegia was ask me and I'll let you know. And right. it was always, mm. what is the quality of life? Yeah. So if yeah. I have quality of life to carry on, yeah. let's carry on. Yeah. But if I don't, please help me end it mercifully. Yeah. 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 I, I didn't realise you didn't know that. No, no. I, that, that's... That's interesting. I mean, it just makes sense of mum and dad, you know. They, yeah, that's, that's how they, they do work. that. Kind yeah, of thing. I, I absolutely, hundred percent promise you yeah. that I'm yeah. not. I'm not making up that recollection. That yeah. that's a real one. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So I, for me in my situation now, I'm finding it surprisingly easy mm. to say, yeah, I'm cool with euthanasia. Yeah. Uh, because mum mm. was a palliative nurse and she was totally cool with it. Mum mm. and dad had a euthanasia pact that. I've grown up with them, you know, from my formative years, from 10 until I moved out of home at about 22, 22 23, I moved out of home, mm. um, with like, yeah, yeah, this is how it is, and it's fine with us. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't realise at the time, but it's actually ended up being, well, here I am at 52, 53, mm. and it's a real thing for me now. Yeah. And I'm actually just yeah. processing like, oh, yeah, it's totally valid. Yeah. Um, whereas a lot of people are really struggling with it, and oh, I'm like, yeah. I'm like, no, no, no. I've been thinking about this since I was ten years old, mm. Mm. so I'm okay with it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there you go. So that was um, this conversation has gone <laughs> a lot longer than than I, than I thought. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is my oldest brother Dave, and um, this has been cancer update. Whatever number we're up to, it might be fifty six, but I've, I've, if I'm honest with you, I've forgotten. And um, we'll post again soon. So um, please wish me a happy birthday. It's it's birthday um, day five for me today, <laughs> and um, and we'll keep going. So oh, yeah. thanks, Dave. Right, and we'll You're talk welcome. to you again soon. Thanks okay. very much. See you bye later. Bye.